Hello and welcome to your very own motoring magazine show, Four Wheels Good. Every week we cover a wide range of motoring subjects, but we regularly return to one that's very dear to most of our hearts, classic cars. And then we call our old friend John Stanley, who always has a couple of hundred classic car stories to tell us. We devote the whole of this special edition of Four Wheels Good to classics old and new, John's lifetime passion. Ginny Buckley joined him for coffee. John Stanley, a face I've seen many times on screen, but this is really the first time we've properly met. It is, isn't it? It is, and it surprised me actually from talking to you how much more you've done apart from cars. We know you as a classic car expert, but you, you've got a bit of a, a wide and checkered history, haven't you? Well, you, were, you got hold of a CV, didn't you? <laughs> I did. <laughs> yes, I mean, cars have always been a passion. I mean, I've, I've adored them since being a member of the Oxford Motor Club back in art school days. But uh, yes, there is another world outside cars, as indeed it is for enthusiasts. I mean, people, very few people actually live and breathe just cars. And uh, I've had a lot to do with show business and a great deal to do with music and a certain amount with public figures. But I imagine recently cars have been taking up a huge part of your life because you've been working on this, haven't you? The, the second volume of Stanley, the Stanley Classic Car Yearbook. Yes, that does take about six months of the year, but um, it's just a delight to do because I love cars. And I'm not particularly a fan of the classic tag. I think a classic car is something that, rather like a pet that adopts you or that you like. I don't think it's anything really to do with the years in question. So this kind of idea that, okay, a car's now 20 years old, it suddenly becomes a classic. You think classics can be from any year? It's critical if you're going to compete. Obviously, mm. you've got to have a cutoff point. And the RAC were really forced into this by the sheer volume of interest. And so the 20 year cutoff makes sense. But in real terms, a, a motoring enthusiast will love a car irrespective of the year it was made. It's what that character has, what that car will do, how it even looks. A lot of it's to do with appearances. I think that love you do have for classics comes across in the book, and certainly in this huge chunk of it, which is Stanley's Classic 100. What criteria do you use for selecting those cars? It's purely cars that I either love or hate. Um, there aren't many of them, but there are one or two that are turkeys. And um, they're really just, I believe that classic cars in the sense are very much as if you and I were in the pub talking. It's a, it's a collective thing. We've all got opinions on cars that we like to share them. We'll listen to each other. It won't necessarily mean we'll alter our opinion. Yeah. But it is an exchange of information. It's rather like with pop groups. You like a particular pop group and you support them, but you're open to, have you heard so-and-so? Yeah. And then you go away and listen to it. And it's a bit that with cars. And the Stanley 100 is very much if you like, my menu of 100 cars that I find interesting, stimulating, or sadly, in one or two cases, <laughs> mistakes. I seem to be giving Ford a bad time, and I don't really mean it, but some of the recent styling have been a bit sad. Well, before the new Edge design, do you mean? Or? Well, I mean, the Scorpio doesn't seem to have a reason to exist. I mean, that, I, mean I think I headlined it in last year's book as why. And unfortunately, the, the probe, in a way, represents a huge mistake. Um, it had no excuse to be that poor because the Capri had a very solid following. The Probe has none of the needs, it has none of the line, the, the, there isn't any muscle, there's no sense of line or form down the side. It just looks like a kit car put on top of a platform. And that's a sad thing for Ford to have done because they've made some gorgeous cars in the past. Well, as you said, there's turkeys and there's some, a lot of good cars in there. How many of these have you actually driven? You oh, pretty you much all of them, yeah. I mean, one or two of the Stanley 100. Um, there's a Lynx in there, for instance, a Lee Francis Lynx, which I don't think anyone drove, um, which actually that too was a turkey. That was actually at a motor show and it was mauve with gold instead of chrome. Mm. And um, for Lee Francis, who again had had a distinguished career in the past, that was a bit sad. I haven't driven that because I don't think, I don't even know if it still exists. Mm -hmm. But by and large, yes, all of them. And certainly all the main road tests are all a matter of uh, driving and assessment. And John, from the classic list, of course, you've done the unthinkable and you've picked one as the star of the book. How did you manage to choose that? This year, it's the British sports cars from the 60s. They're all two-seaters. And again, they have to be under a thousand pounds. And it is all the editors of the motoring magazines. It is those who have a feeling and a passion. And this year, yes, this year it's the Austin Healey that's won. And it won by what? By an, a, a huge, huge margin. margin. Last year it was much closer between the Morris Minor and the VW Beetle, which would have pleased you, wouldn't it? Yeah, my um, first car. But uh, this year it was a runaway success for the Healey 3000 with the Lotus 7 running behind it, but some ways behind. What do you think the appeal of the Healey is? 
Well, it's still a style statement. It's not just that it was a powerful car. In fact, um, the image it's got is largely one of being a very hairy beast. And in last year's book, I talked about a drive I had in the last works car, which was a very hairy beast. But they were very rare, just like the current rally cars are. There's definitely a huge crop of sports cars out there at the moment. Um, I think manufacturers are going more and more back to this kind of retro image. They're almost, almost trying to recreate instant classics. I did undertake the sort of major piece in this year's book is a 20,000 word report, which is rather longer than any motoring magazine could cope with. Yeah. It's one of the charms of a book is you've got space. It's a bit like having a TV special. Sure. You've got extra time. And in there, I've spent five months in the end testing 12 modern sports cars that are all claiming to be classics in some form or another. And most of them are working quite seriously on using retro styling. You and I have both driven most of them. I've certainly have driven all of them. There does really seem to be a huge crop of, of good sports cars around at the minute. Which, which were the ones that stood out to you from that crop? Well, the 12 that I made tests on um, covered the whole gambit from the little um, MX-5 and the MGF, which I was a little disappointed with, mm -hmm. all the way through to the 355 Ferrari. And the therefore, price range there as well. It's really. huge, but it, I've tried, no, it's not a comparative. Magazines have a terrible habit for the sake of selling their, their journal of making comparisons between cars that really aren't alike. And it's not fair on either manufacturer because they've aimed at a specific market and suddenly they're being compared and damned by a car from a different bracket. So I've, they're isolated pieces. However, they do group up in some ways. Some of them are sporting cars, some of them are sports cars, and some of them are really GTs. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, they're grouped, but they're not compared. Of them, I suppose the Mercedes SLK was a bit of a disappointment. Um, Why? I found, uh, indeed, I took a picture of it with a C-class saloon, because there's no shame in that, but that's actually all it is. It is a saloon with sophisticated styling. Yeah. As a Grand Tourer, for that kind of money, the roof's very clever and they have a reputation like they did with the old gullwing of clever roofs. And that's fine, perpetuate that. But when it came down to it, to Grand Tour in that car, you're going to be reasonably well heeled and you will have luggage. The publishers didn't publish the picture, which I would have loved. I took a picture of the boot with the hood down, which is after all what you're going to have if it's cruising and it would take a standard size Kellogg's cornflake packet and that's the height of your luggage. That's no good, that's not a grand tourer, that's a grand show off. It seems to have, be struggling to find exactly where it fits. And the automatic gearbox is, mm. is a lovely gearbox. But not in a sporting no, car. No, it gets in a muddle, it, it yeah. tries, it has this intelligence which will work out your style and give you the gear you want. But halfway through a corner you'd really rather have transmission than hear it whirring while it sorts out your mind. Don't you really think that a sports car is all about the fact that you've got to have fun in it, you've got to be allowed to drive it and whip it through those gears yourself? Yeah, I mean the XK8, which is in here too, um, that curiously enough works, but then it doesn't pretend to be a sports car so much as it's a, a, grand tourer. Yeah, a Grand Tourer. And Grand Touring really with an automatic isn't a contradiction because long haul you might as well be comfortable. It has the power and if you kick it down, it works. So what about that out and out fun? What's one to put a smile on your fun. face and let you oh. zip round those roads in? I don't know. I suppose the Porsche Boxster, which I know you've experienced, is a gem. It's an, I'm not a big Porsche fan, but that car is a delight. Mm. And there's a lot more room in it, as we've both discovered, than it appears. You can pack a surprising amount in, can't I quite you? like the little Fiat Barchetta. My, my mum and dad own a Fiat Barchetta. They're one Do of, they? They're one of the people who have, have sort of stuck with the waiting list and yeah. thought yeah we're going to go for it we're going to have a left hand drive and they have been absolutely thrilled and I think styling Very honest. wise it's lovely styling beautiful and it in a sense it fulfills the role that in the classic era the MGB I mean it had no pretensions to be but it was a lovely open sports car that anyone could own the Baquetta really is much the same it's a very nice classy car I enjoyed it the big surprise I suppose was probably the Fiat uh, Turbo Coupe which um, had no excuse to perform as well as it did. In 0 to 60 it beat the Porsche, the Mercedes, the DB7, the Jag. Only the 355 was quicker to 60. Um, the stowage is great. There are, rear, there are rear seats to a point. It's great fun. 
And this was a surprise because it's not what you expect from a Fiat, really, is it? They have in the past produced a couple, but it's, it's, it's been a rarity and a wait list is certainly a rarity. Well, a Fiat with a waiting list. Let's yes. see a report that you've done and let's just take a closer look at it. It's lovely. With the release of every new major motor car comes a crop of PRs and willing journalists who are happy to call it a classic, whatever it is. History eventually proves them right or wrong, but in the meantime we're left with this borrowed aura around most of the cars that we consider desirable. One of the privileges of having your own book is that you have space. And in this year I've managed to take a look at 12 of what we call dream cars and see if they perhaps really are just borrowing from their past or have a place in future motoring history. There are MGs, there are Lotuses, there are BMWs, there are Alphas. There are any number of them which appear to be classics. And over 20,000 words, I've taken a look, and there are disappointments. The MGF, although a desirable car, really feels unfinished, and many journalists have called it a brick, a builder's brick from behind. There are surprises, there are some beautiful things like the 355 Ferrari that is almost flawless, the Porsche Boxster, which really and truly is without a parallel for handling. But above all else, there was one big surprise. It just shows the badges aren't everything. This is the stunningly beautiful Fiat. No one expected a car of this calibre from a company that really in the past has been known for rust buckets, for runabout cars that fell apart. They don't even have a real lineage. They put Ferrari engines in briefly for a period at the Dino, but you have to look back to the 50s and an extraordinary car they called simply a V8, which was a lightweight car with a V8 engine naturally, and just 114 were built. They didn't quite know what to do with it. If calling a car simply a V8 in the 50s was an unromantic kind of notion, Fiat haven't really changed too much now because although this car is a real stunner, it doesn't call it anything romantic now. It is simply a Fiat Coupe 20 valve turbo. Fortunately, it drives a whole lot better than it reads. The lights aren't just on the outside of this car, the cockpit is pure pleasure. Pinaferina themselves designed the interior and the colour coding across the dash is reminiscent of the old MGAs and Alphas and indeed they proudly carry their name on the colour here. The controls are all very, very straightforward. There's none of these curves and high fashioned areas where they're no use to you, they're just pretty. This is functional and it gets on with it and so does the engine. This is the turbocharged version, which delivers 220 brake horse. That actually gives you an enormous power band. The thing about the turbo with Fiat is they've managed to create one that develops its power low down so that the minimum amount of turbo lag and the maximum amount of power when you need it, when you're accelerating. In fact, driving it is, is twofold. You can drive it like a madman and it will go in exactly that manner. Or if you keep it in a slightly higher gear than you'd expect to, the turbo will always catch up with you so that you can drive it in a docile manner and then when you put your foot down, it picks up and responds. It's a very easy way of driving, particularly on motorways. But when you actually want pleasure, you only have to take it down a couple of cogs and the performance we found when we were testing the 12 cars was actually faster to 60 than a Porsche Boxster, than the Mercedes SLK, than the Aston Martin DB7. It is a real flyer. However beautiful this car is, and it is beautiful, the real triumph is in the performance. 
45 in first, the speed limit on a motorway in second, 100 in third, 135 in fourth, 155 if you're lucky, in top. That's an astonishing figure, particularly from a Fiat. The triumph is reflected in the fact even Watcar magazine has voted this coupe two years in a row, coupe of the year. The last laugh for the owners, I guess, when they look at this book, is that of the 12 cars, this car is the second fastest to 60 behind a £100,000 Ferrari. Then, only by just over a second and a half. It is, by any standards, a triumph, and it is, by any standards, a future classic. Hello and welcome back to this week's special edition of Four Wheels Good. Special because John Stanley has at last been pinned down by our intrepid Ginny Buckley in between flights on Concord or Royal Party arranging. His true passion in life is one that we all share, classic cars. The important thing with classics is they're really judged by the public because a classic will only survive truthfully if people care enough for it to maintain it. And Morris Minor is a good example. You Another know, one, of course, is a Mini. And the Mini, Which yes. keeps on coming when we've seen the recent Mini yeah. unveiled at Frankfurt. Did you like it? Um, no, I didn't at all. No. I thought that what they did with Spiritual, which was yes, the, the one, concept yes, before... was much better. ...far more exciting. Mm. No, I didn't. I, it didn't evoke those classic memories to me, no. which I think is a shame, because that's what Mini's all about. It's Your first car was a Mini. I've owned a number of Minis, and I love them. Um, I dedicated the book itself to my very first one. And I gave that a terrible time, but it stayed with me and we were great friends, which is what a classic should be. I did recently look at the new Cooper S's that John Cooper has been producing. And I've owned two of the genuine 1275 original S's and one of those was works tuned. And I have to say I was a bit disappointed. I mean, the article in here hasn't damned them, but um, 17 grand for the car I was driving is a lot of money for not the dated styling. The styling is the thing, curiously enough, that holds it together still. Yeah. Um, I, I was slightly ill at ease with finding John Cooper's name on everything from the dipstick to the window winder, but that's fine nowadays. You mark it, but it's sort of overpowered the Mini. What is sad is that the S was always synonymous with real power, and this now is really easy to upset. It's gone on to 13-inch wheels, and of course the original was on 10, and the center of gravity has changed. So in fact, when you actually chuck it about, which you could do in a brilliant way with the old ones, particularly in rallying, mm. um, now you can't. It wobbles or it topples or it bottoms out. It's, it's not going to work on the same scale. There's one chapter in the book um, along those lines that actually convinced, it, well, convinced me that it, it's quite feasible to own a Ferrari. It's far more affordable than you think. Yes, I don't think the F40 possibly can the car, <laughs> but um, yes, it is. I mean, we have taken quite a lot of time. We looked at the uh, 512 Testarossa and at a 328 to see you, you, know, you see cheap ones and you think, I don't know, I could just about manage that. And then you're in fear of the service costs or the dramas. And in fact, it's one of those situations where if you buy sensibly, then actually it can leave you with something to be very proud of and still leave you some money in the bank. These cars, for, you know, people say that they're very expensive and it's all right, but if you can afford to buy one, it's all right buying one, but it's actually running one. It's a myth. They actually don't understand uh, the cost of running a car isn't very expensive at all, in a respect of compared to the other half's car. Um, you know, if you looked at a 308, you'd have to do the cam belts on a 308 every three years. Well, if you averaged that over the three-year period, it would be about £400 a year. Uh, a service, you'd probably only do one service a year, and that would cost you £400. If you split that over the three period, you're looking at maybe £800 a year, which is not over the top to run a car of that calibre. The key stability of these make them a safe bet. This particular car costs £44,000, which is an awful lot of money. But you only need to put 10000 down as a deposit, which if you're in this kind of market isn't a lot. And then over the next three years you'd pay around £500-£550 a month, with a single balloon payment at the end of 21000 the balloon system is something that's caught a lot of people out, but when a car sustains its value, as Ferrari does now, there is no real risk. Three years later, 
this car would be worth £30,000 and that's based on if you'd done 6000 a year. So you've got 18,000 miles of usage and three years of the car and then you're faced with 21000 as a final payment. However, the car would be worth 30, given the condition, of course. So you could have this car for three years and at the end sell it and still have enough money for the deposit for another one. There's another um, chapter in there that really appeals to me. That I mean, I, there are so many of the cars in this book that I would love to drive, but I would love to own rather, but mm. could never afford to do. But you give a nice little, his nice little um, chapter on, on the miniature cars, on the ones we can all afford to go out and buy, don't you? <laughs> yes, that's a very strong field. Um, if you look yeah. at the classic car mags, they all cover it, um, and no one seems to belittle them. But in actual fact, it's a very, very hardcore following and there are some beautiful models. There's a real art to it, isn't there? Yes. I mean, I was actually taken around one of the factories and the, I forget they've got a flash name for it, but there are wooden moulds that they make and they lacquer them up. And they're like sculptures. They're the sort of thing you want to touch. Mm. Apparently they're worth a fortune. And yes, we do. We do a, a, a little model of the year, which ironically this year is an Allegro. I cane the, <laughs> the Allegro proper, I cane in this, and the actual model is a hand-built one. And the man that, that creates them is ex-Stinky. So, I mean, you know, he's got all his own credentials. So and, uh, yes, the models are a very strong area. Did you see the Pink Floyd drummer yeah. in one of the classic mags recently with this huge, huge collection of Ferraris? They're all 143rd scale. Well, I know as a young, a young girl, I foolishly promised my dad that I would buy him a Porsche when I was an old, rich woman. <laughs> and I've not got to that point yet, but he's got a model. <laughs> Safe so bet. Great it's... for Christmas. <laughs> One final thing for you, John. You probably won't be able to answer this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. There's an afterlife somewhere, okay? And we can take something with us, and it can be metal, and it can have four wheels. What do you take? Oh, I'm not sure I could answer that. One car out of this book. Probably the Citroen Diane. It never lets you down. It puts everything on board. I wouldn't have to worry about racing around up there. I could just load anything I want and go anywhere, wouldn't I? I think we should end on that. John Stanley's tips for a good <laughs> life, something that never lets you down. Sounds good. And look out for further reports from John on a wide variety of automobile finery. It's a strange thing, but once you know a little about cars, you're hooked. Anything other than your average retmobile soon stands out on the street. So why don't you share our pleasant addiction with us again next week? on Four Wheels Good.